the site selection committee had narrowed the field down to two sites Hadley Rill, a deep channel on the edge of Mare Imbrium close to the Apennine Mountains or the crater Marius, near which were a group of low, possibly volcanic, domes. Although not ultimately his decision, the commander of a mission always held great sway. To David Scott the choice was clear, as Hadley had more variety. There is a certain intangible quality which drives the spirit of exploration and I felt that Hadley had it. Besides it looked beautiful and usually when things look good they're good. The selection of Hadley was made although NASA lacked high-resolution images of the landing site, none had been made as the site was considered too rough to risk one of the earlier Apollo missions. The proximity of the Apennine Mountains to the Hadley site required a landing approach trajectory of 26 degrees, far steeper than the 15 degrees in earlier Apollo landings. The expanded mission meant that Worden spent much of his time at North American Rockwell's facilities at Downey, California, where the command and service module was being built. Working with El Baz, he studied maps and photographs of the craters he would pass over while orbiting alone in the CSM. As El Baz listened and gave feedback, Worden learned how to describe lunar features in a way that would be useful to the scientists who would listen to his transmissions back on Earth. Worden found El Baz to be an enjoyable and inspiring teacher. Worden usually accompanied his crewmates on their geology field trips, though he was often in an airplane overhead, describing features of the landscape as the plane simulated the speed at which the lunar landscape would pass below the CSM. The demands of the training strained both Warden's and Irwin's marriages, each sought Scott's advice, fearing a divorce might endanger their places on the mission as not projecting the image NASA wanted for the astronauts. Scott consulted Director of Flight Crew Operations Dickie Slayton, their boss, who stated what was important was that the astronauts do their jobs. Although the Irwins overcame their marital difficulties, the Wardens divorced before the mission. Apollo 15 used Command and Service Module CSM-112, which was given the callsign Endeavor, named after HMS Endeavor, and Lunar Module LM-10, callsign Falcon, named after the United States Air Force Academy mascot. Scott explained the choice of the name Endeavor on the grounds that its captain, James Cook had commanded the first purely scientific sea voyage, and Apollo 15 was the first lunar landing mission on which there was a heavy emphasis on science. Apollo 15 took with it a small piece of wood from Cook's ship, while Falcon carried two Falcon feathers to the moon in recognition of the crew's service in the Air Force. ALSJ-3, also part of the spacecraft were a launch escape system and a spacecraft lunar module adapter, numbered SLA-19. Technicians at the Kennedy Space Center had some problems with the instruments in the service module's scientific instrument module bay. Some instruments were late in arriving, and principal investigators or representatives of NASA contractors sought further testing or to make small changes. Mechanical problems came from the fact that the instruments were designed to operate in space, but had to be tested on the surface of the Earth. Things like the 7.5 meters booms for the mass and gamma ray spectrometers could be tested only using equipment that tried to mimic the space environment, and, in space, the mass spectrometer boom several times did not fully retract. On the lunar module, the fuel and oxidizer tanks were enlarged on both the descent and ascent stages, and the engine bell on the descent stage was extended. In all this increased the weight of the lunar module to 36,000 pounds, 4,000 pounds heavier than previous models. If Apollo 15 had flown as an H mission, it would have been with CSM-111 and LM-9. That CSM was used by the Apollo Soyuz test project in 1975, ALSJ-4, but the lunar module went unused and is now at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. Endeavour is on display at the National Museum of the United States Air Force at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, following its transfer of ownership from NASA to the Smithsonian in December 1974. Launch vehicle the Saturn V that launched Apollo 15 was designated SAW 510, the 10th flight-ready model of the rocket. As the payload of the rocket was greater, changes were made to the rocket and to its launch trajectory. These two changes meant 1,100 pounds more could be launched. Once all major systems were installed in the Saturn V, it was moved from the Vehicle Assembly Building to the launch site, Launch Complex 39A. During late June and early July 1971, the rocket and launch umbilical tower were struck by lightning at least four times. There was no damage to the vehicle, and only minor damage to ground support equipment. Spacesuits The Apollo 15 astronauts wore redesigned spacesuits. On all previous Apollo flights, including the non-lunar flights, the commander and lunar module pilot had worn suits with the life support, liquid cooling, and communications connections in two parallel rows of three. On Apollo 15, the new suits, dubbed the A7LB, had the connectors situated in triangular pairs.
As in all missions from and after Apollo 13, the commander's suit bore a red stripe on the helmet, arms and legs. ALSJ-5, Worden wore a suit similar to those worn by the Apollo 14 astronauts, but modified to interface with Apollo 15's equipment. Gear needed only for lunar surface AVAs, such as the liquid cooling garment, was not included with Warden's suit, as the only EVA he was expected to do was one to retrieve film cartridges from the Sim Bay on the flight home. A vehicle that could operate on the surface of the moon had been considered by NASA since the early 1960s. An early version was called MOLAB, which had a closed cabin and would have massed about 6,000 pounds, some scaled-down prototypes were tested in Arizona. As it became clear NASA would not soon establish a lunar base, such a large vehicle seemed unnecessary. Still, a rover would enhance the J missions, which were to concentrate on science, though its mass was limited to about 500 pounds and it was not then clear that so light a vehicle could be useful. NASA did not decide to proceed with a rover until May 1969, as Apollo 10, the dress rehearsal for the moon landing, made its way home from lunar orbit. Boeing received the contract for three rovers on a cost-plus basis, overruns meant the three vehicles eventually cost a total of $40 million. These cost overruns gained considerable media attention at a time of greater public weariness with the space program, when NASA's budget was being cut. ALS J6, the lunar roving vehicle could be folded into a space 5 feet by 20 in. Traveling at speeds up to 6 to 8 miles per hour, ALS J6, it meant that for the first time the astronauts could travel far afield from their lander and still have enough time to do some scientific experiments. The Apollo 15 rover bore a plaque, reading, Man's First Wheels on the Moon, delivered by Falcon, July 30, 1971. The Apollo 15 Particles in Field subsatellite was a small satellite released into lunar orbit from the Sim Bay just before the mission left orbit to return to Earth. Its main objectives were to study the plasma, particle, and magnetic field environment of the Moon and map the lunar gravity field. The basic requirement was that the satellite acquire fields and particle data everywhere on the orbit around the Moon. As well as measuring magnetic fields, the satellite contained sensors to study the Moon's mass concentrations, or MASCONs. The satellite orbited the Moon and returned data from August 4, 1971, until January 1973, when, following multiple failures of the subsatellite's electronics, ground support was terminated. It is believed to have crashed into the moon sometime thereafter. The command and service module and the lunar module remained attached to the nearly exhausted SIVB booster. Once trans-lunar injection had been achieved, placing the spacecraft on a trajectory towards the moon, explosive cords separated the CSM from the booster as Worden operated the CSM's thrusters to push it away. Worden then maneuvered the CSM to dock with the LM, and the combined craft was then separated from the SIVB by explosives. After Apollo 15 separated from the booster, the SIVB maneuvered away, and, as planned, impacted the moon about an hour after the crewed spacecraft entered lunar orbit, though due to an error the impact was 79 nautical miles away from the intended target.